Hey everyone, thanks for being here. Um, in today's video, I wanted to elaborate some more, uh, do a follow-up on the iPad and Ableton workflow that I've shared about previously on YouTube, as well as on Substack. Um, I figured a video demonstration of some of the things that I've elaborated on in writing on Substack uh, in response to some of the frequent questions that come up about the process would be a little more helpful uh, than answering some of that in text. So. The purpose of today's video, I have my setup just as normal here um, in my studio. I, I'm going to approach it from a completely blank slate. Uh, I have no idea what's going to happen in terms of audio. I have nothing planned. I'm just going to walk through you know, the whole thing, uh, approach it as if I was coming into the studio cold, and show you some of the deeper settings uh, within Ableton, uh, the MIDI configurations that I use, uh, how exactly the audio in the MIDI is coming through from laptop to iPad and then back again to the laptop. And some of the things you can do with MIDI controllers, I'll connect a couple of those and just walk through how the um, MIDI sharing can work uh, with the Audio 4C interface that I'm using. So if you haven't seen it already, I would recommend the general overview of the process that I prepared um, about a year ago now. That's on YouTube. I'll link to it here somehow, some way. Um, I think it's good grounding for what I'm talking about here. This is a lot more about the specifics of that workflow. So I'm not going to go, you know, uh, you know, into the um, apps that I prefer or things like that. You can watch all that somewhere else. Um, this is more about, you know, how it's set up, how it works, what's possible, and a little bit more detail about the, um, the configuration and some of the flexibility that it can give you. So I have um, two cameras here. I'll, I'll set those up. I'll use some screen sharing. I have a couple topics that I'm going to hit um, in a planned way. So hopefully this makes sense. Um, thanks again for watching. Uh, and without further ado, let's get into it. All right, so let's get to it. Um, I've got two cameras set up. One's focused on the laptop. The other is on the, you know, general uh, desk here. And then I also have screen recording enabled for the laptop. I'll apologize in advance for the audio quality of my voice. I was not able to find my microphone for whatever reason today. So. Uh, we're just using the built-in mic on the laptop, so apologies for that. Um, but as you can see, everything on this desk right now is basically my entire setup. Occasionally I've got a MIDI controller sitting here, or occasionally I have an OctaTrack uh, sitting here as an external sampling device. But other than that, uh, this is really it. Um, as I mentioned in the intro, I'm kind of assuming that you're already a little bit familiar with both uh, Ableton Live as well as um, this general practice of, you know, why I like to use the Audio 4C to send audio and MIDI back and forth between these two things. So I'm going to kind of breeze through this a little bit quicker than I normally would with someone who's brand new to this. Uh, definitely go watch the video. Uh, that I've posted before and read the Substack article um, about my process if you want to get uh, some of the background here. Um, but to start, let's uh, jump in to uh, how things are set up on the computer starting with Ableton Live. So this is my default setup. Every time I load Ableton Live, uh, I have Live 11 Suite uh, this is what pops up. I like to group um, my MIDI tracks, so software synths, contact instruments, VSTs, things of that nature that are making noise and being sequenced uh, with MIDI notes from external sources, uh, or internal, whatever. Uh, just all my instruments that, that I like to use, those are grouped uh, accordingly here on this you know blue group called MIDI. I like to group things within Ableton. I find it's really useful for organization uh, and keeps things orderly. So highly recommend doing that and taking advantage of all the color coding here um, just as a best practice, make sure you don't get lost. Um, you can see I've got MIDI by default uh, coming from all inputs. So when you click on that dropdown, 
You can see all of the different ports exposed here from the Audio 4C. You've got the five pin uh, DEN MIDI. Uh, you've got the USB host on the back of the device. And importantly, you also have USB 2, uh, which in this case, uh, that's the port that the iPad is plugged into. So, uh, you know, we'll get into this a little bit later when we start to make some noise. But just to point out, this is where you assign precisely where you want your MIDI to come from, uh, given all of the different options that you have with the Audio 4C interface. Um, it's extremely powerful. Uh, you'll notice I have a track by default set up for Core Jam. So I do that um, just in my default set because I like to have the option uh, right away if I want to send MIDI to uh, this device to trigger some interesting chord voicings or what have you. Um, that I wouldn't be able to think of on my own. It's nice to be able to have that ready to go uh, just because I do frequently use it as a as a different way to generate um, sounds and chords and textures that are in the same key that I'm working with. So for me, it's just easy to, to keep it there. Uh, on the audio side, iPad audio is coming into Ableton Live through input 5.6. And when we go over to Oracle and I show how my routing there is set up, that will make more sense. So we'll leave it there for now, uh, but just keep that in mind. And in the settings I use, I've got iPad audio coming into the device uh, from input five and six. You know, you could theoretically also, um, if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to add another track uh, to the setup here, um, you know, you also have external inputs from the front of the 4C, those uh, TRS mic combo jacks on the front. You've got those accessible on input one, two and input three, four, if you want. Um, so I, I sometimes, you know, when I'm using the Octatrack or uh, playing guitar or bass into the, the interface, I'll have that set up. But, I normally don't start there. I'm, I'm usually in the box very much. So I just have this, this iPad channel set up. And on both groups, I've got basic tone shaping uh, plugins ready to go. I like the Fab Filter um, plugins quite a bit. So the Pro Q EQ, as well as the Pro C compressor, those two things are on both of these groups so that everything within them gets processed in a clean and consistent way. On the send return tracks, I've got send return A set up to be uh, my reverb track. So anytime I want to send audio over to um, uh, that that reverb, I've got that dialed in on A. Uh, on B is the Valhalla um, delay. Uh, really, really love this uh, plugin. Probably my all-time favorite delay plugin. I I really like having that available at all times. So. I've got that on send return B anytime I want to send stuff to a delay. And what I've done in this default setup uh, is add an additional return track. You can do that, you know, ad nauseum. Uh, I, I think within Live 11 Suite, there's some kind of limit on there to the number of return tracks that you can configure. But um, I've added an additional one here on C. Uh, so that anytime I want to send audio over to the iPad, uh, I can just dial up that send return C that will go to this track, which is set up to be sent uh, on external audio out 3-4. So again, this will make more sense when we pivot over to Oracle in just a second here. But uh, the important thing to remember is that I treat uh, send C as my goes to iPad um, audio route. Uh, any audio that I want to send over to the iPad, I've got that set up uh, on send return C. And then finally over on the master track, again, just basic tone shaping stuff, um, compressor, EQ, uh, Soothe 2 to squash any overly resonant peaks around the 2K range and then a stock Ableton limiter. Um, one more thing before I move over to the preferences and settings, just when I mentioned that um, send return C going to the iPad, 
I make sure to include a bit of gain staging on there. So I have the utility device just adding a, a bit more gain uh, as well as a limiter on there to make sure that the signal is coming in hot to the iPad and, and ready to go, but it's not being clipped. Um, just be mindful of your gain staging there. It's probably helpful to add these two things on, uh, you know, to your track. So let me flip over to the settings within Live. Uh, when you open up the preferences, this is how I have it configured. It's, you know, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure this is just exactly what happens when you open it uh, fresh and just in a stock setup with any interface anyway. But you can see um, here on the link tempo MIDI page, I've got link enabled. So, you know, you'll see that toggle up in the top left. I really like Ableton Link when I'm working with the iPad. It's important that that's there. Uh, start, stop, sync is on because I like, uh, I typically treat uh, live as the master clock and the engine of everything. So I like to make sure that when I press play or press record or set the tempo here, that's, you know, synchronized with the iPad and the OctaTrack elsewhere. So I've got that turned on. On the MIDI control surfaces, um, I typically don't do much here. I, I really like the Launch Key Mini from Novation. It's a little um, MIDI controller that works particularly well with Ableton Live for DAW control. So I have that set up as a control surface. Um, and I, I always plug that into um, the USB host port on the back of the Audio 4C. So you can see the in and out for that device is going on the host um, port. And when we flip over to Oracle, you'll see that in action, why that is. And then I mentioned in the previous video that I've done about the Imaginando LK control surface, um, super useful app. Uh, it's really nice for, you know, Ableton control for anyone who doesn't want to bother with a hardware external device to control it. Um, that's a great option for, a, for an iPad app. So I have that set up um, for occasional use. Um, takeover mode here, uh, I always set this to pick up because when I'm, you know, turning devices on various controllers, I, I just want to be sure that when I make a change, it doesn't instantly override the existing setting that's uh, on that particular device in Ableton. So for instance, if, you know, I wanted to control send A on a track, and I had that mapped to my Novation controller, but, um, you know, got lost in the mix and then playing and I go back to, to make a change there. It doesn't dramatically um, or drastically alter um, that setting uh, anytime I touch it. It has to override where it's at before it makes a change. So that's, um, that's a useful uh, thing to keep in mind. Um, I like that pickup takeover mode the most. And then finally, just going down to the MIDI ports. So you can see every uh, port on the Audio 4C is exposed here, both in as well as out. And for the inputs, uh, everything coming from, you know, the DIN MIDI ports on the back, the USB 2 device or the iPad, I make sure that track is set up so that Live is ready to receive MIDI information for notes. Um, uh, on the, the software instruments that I'm using. Make sure that you've got track configured if you want live to receive MIDI notes uh, from external devices. And also too, check out the boxes down here on the left. Um, I constantly, you know, make sure that this help window is open and ready to go. Because anytime you've got a question about any of those settings, just hover over that um, and it will tell you exactly what this button is doing. So. Things that I want to send MIDI notes to Ableton with, I've got configured with track. And then on remote, things that I want to control live with, I have that enabled too. So typically on every MIDI port that's available, I've got remote set up in case I want to control live with my iPad, in case I want to control it with my OctaTrack or you know, my DJ Tech Tools um, MIDI Fighter Twister. I'll pull that out in a minute but 
really useful to have uh, the ability to control live through that device too. So everything here, the USB host, the um, second USB jack, uh, and then also the, um, the MIDI DIM port, all of that can control live. And then the only difference down here for the outputs, I've got sync set up on the DIN port because when I'm playing with my Octatrack in Ableton Live, I like for Live, like I said, to be the master engine, the master clock. When I hit play or hit record or change the tempo, when I have sync configured here, that information goes out the MIDI DIN port and to the Octatrack, and it makes sure that things are in sync. So. Otherwise, I've got everything set up to track and remote, uh, just in case I want to use live to control external things too. Um, it's, a, it's a good option to have. And then finally, just on the audio side. So you can see audio input output device is set to audio 4C, of course. Um, and then on the input configuration, I don't do much with mono work. Uh, occasionally, if I have a mic plugged in or something, then I'll use it, but I typically don't even look at that side. I just make sure that the stereo inputs are enabled over on the right uh, for both input as well as output. So all uh, ins and outs are available and ready to assign. I've got my buffer size set to 256. You can go lower, especially on these new you know, Apple uh, computers. They're pretty in incredible, the M series chips. They're lightning fast, they're very capable, but I like to set it at a high enough level that I'm comfortable no matter how complicated my session gets, no matter how many VSTs, software sense I'm using, I'm, I'm always comfortable with the fact that it's not gonna choke up and seize up trying to process audio too quickly. Um, and so the latency is a little bit higher than what you would probably use in a full band setting if you were tracking drums and whatnot with a live band. But for my purposes, it's perfectly fine. It, it works okay. Um, no big issues there. And then the sample rate I've got set to 48 kilohertz because by default, that's the way that um, Om and most other iPad apps are set up anyway. So I just I just keep it there um, for consistency. Okay, so that's Ableton Live. Um, this is my default template setup. And now when we flip over to the Oracle uh, control software for the Audio 4C, uh, you can see this is what you're presented with um, right away. So you've got the ability to uh, mix and route audio, uh, route your MIDI, uh, filter your MIDI signals if you want to you know, get really crazy and complicated. Um, you've also got this section for USB hosts. So, uh, as well as firmware downloads. So I'm only gonna focus on two things here. I keep it very simple. Um, occasionally I will mess around in the audio section and occasionally I will mess around in the USB host section. So let's start with the audio. Um, some people dislike this. Uh, I sort of dislike it, but the way that um, iConnectivity sets you up with Oracle to control the Audio 4C is through these four different preset routings. So you've got uh, Record, um, which has uh, set up the you know possibilities this way. You've got Play USB 1, Play USB 2, depending on which USB-C jack on the back uh, you want to be driving the show. Uh, it you know just slight variation there and then a streaming setup that has some pretty, uh, you know, to me, convoluted um, <laughs> loopback audio stuff going on if you're a big podcaster or YouTube creator, I guess that's useful for you. But I literally never touch record. I never touch stream. I very rarely touch USB 2 when I want the iPad to be like a mixing surface for live shows. I've used that very occasionally. But by and large, I just live on this setting here, uh, play USB 1. Um, the great thing about Oracle, you know, for all its faults, it's a little buggy and, and kind of not that flexible uh, with the audio routing. You can flip this tooltips 
uh, you know, button anytime you want. Anytime you get lost or confused by what these things are doing, just turn that on, hover your mouse over the setting, and it will show you exactly what's happening in terms of the audio routing. So I think this is where people get lost sometimes is, you know, what are all these settings doing? What's different here? Uh, just keep in mind, just flip the tooltips on, hover your mouse over it, and you can see exactly what's up here. So like I said, my laptop is almost always the central engine of whatever I'm doing, whether I'm playing live, uh, whether I'm recording in the studio, uh, you know, it's typically my main uh, audio production device. So I've always just kind of used Play USB 1 just out of habit, and I've learned to use it that way. Um, so as you can see, the audio inputs on the front of the Audio 4C inputs one through four, that looks the same in this setting on either device. So whether you're looking at the laptop or looking at the iPad, those front four jacks are always gonna show up on both devices as one, two, three, four, um, no matter what you do. It's easy to remember that way. Where it gets different and you know the variation here between USB 1 and USB 2 is what happens with the outputs. So on Play USB 1, um, whatever device you've got plugged in to the port 2, in my case it's the iPad, but that device, its outputs, whether you, its main outputs on 1, 2, or its secondary outputs on 3, 4, those are going to show up on the second half of the eight inputs on the other device. So from the iPad, output one, two goes to input five, six on the laptop. Output three, four from the iPad goes to input seven, eight on the laptop. And then the same is true in reverse. So on laptop, USB one, output one, two, or the main signal goes to input 5.6 on the iPad, and then output 3.4 goes to input 7.8 on the iPad. What I just said there might sound complicated, it might sound confusing, but trust me, just you know, practice a little bit, read this tooltips carefully, and watch what happens when you play, and you'll quickly get the hang of it, trust me. Um, it's, it's not as complicated as it might seem. So, the benefit of using this Play USB 1 configuration and why I've learned to just kind of live here um, after using this device for so long is that this send return track C that I have set up in my Ableton session, when I want to send audio to the iPad, I dial up that send uh, set you know to C and then that goes to, to output 3.4 um, every time. So when you know it goes to output three four, it's then received on the iPad um, on input seven eight. I just remember that now. It, I intuitively know it. it. I know it's ready to go. And for me, it's easier to mix the amount of audio going to the iPad with a send device like this than it is to remember digital routings. So I like to see how much of any given sound I'm sending over there. And the easiest way for me to do that is to set up a specific output that I always know will go to the iPad. Um, so that's how I use this 4C. That's how I use Oracle. That's the setting that I always live on. And maybe the most important thing to remember for, for these purposes, you see within the analog one two mix so the main outputs on the back of the interface that go to your speakers or go to the house pa or whatever um, by default it has uh, the main outputs from the ipad mixed in there too i don't like for that to happen i always mute that usb2 signal so when i have the ipad plugged into usb2 the only way i can hear the audio coming out of it is when I dial up that specific channel in Ableton Live. So, um, you know, for instance, if I'm listening to something on Spotify on my iPad, um, I, I, you know, if I wanted to hear that through my main speakers and I'm not making music or anything, I could unmute it and I would hear that coming from the iPad. But when I'm producing music, 
when I'm performing music, I don't like for the main output of the iPad to be heard any other way than through this channel that I've set up for it. So keep that in mind. I like to make sure that uh, you know that signal is muted in the main output mix uh, in this particular configuration. So I know that's a lot of information all at once. It sounds more complicated than it actually is. But once you know you get into the rhythm, you practice a little bit, you get used to the terminology here, it starts to make sense. Um, and we'll see what that looks like in practice, you know, when we start making sound here in a bit. But uh, the other thing I want to mention is that, you know, in my Substack post, I, I linked to this particular software, uh, but there is a different alternative control software that's available to use for the icon activity interfaces. It's called reconfig for audio. I'm not going to go super deep in here today because I don't use it a whole lot. But if you need, you know, really fine control of each of the outputs available to you, and you want to be much more clear and flexible about the way that audio is being routed to and from these devices, it has a really nice patch bay set up uh, that looks just like this. So you can, you know, choose where any given input is sent uh, through the outputs over here on the right. In a, in a very classic, uh, clean matrix mixer kind of configuration. So a very useful tool to have if you don't um, like using Oracle or you need a little more flexibility. Uh, just, um, yeah, keep that in mind. And then again, remember, tool tips are your friend. Flip those on anytime you get lost and read what's you know uh, being uh, stated here. Okay, so all that's out of the way. Um, I've shown you what's happening in my uh, default Ableton setup. Um, I've shown you how I've configured uh, the Oracle software. Look at that. This always happens. This is probably the my number one gripe with the software is how often it, it uh, resets itself like that. Um, don't worry, it doesn't change your settings or, you know, stop audio or anything, but you just have to reopen it if you want to get back to the control surface here. Um, yeah, so all that, you know, has been configured. This is how I'm using it uh, for, for this particular setup. Let's turn our attention over to the iPad now. Um, I'll show you how I'm setting up AUM, what happens, uh, you know, um, in a typical workflow for me uh, to get audio on here as well as send it back to the, the laptop. Okay, so next let's turn our attention over to the iPad. We've got the computer doing its thing over here uh, connected to um, port 1 on the 4C. The iPad is connected to port 2, and the nice thing about the 4C is that the whole time it's connected there, it's also charging. So you don't have to worry about any other dongles or any other you know power adapters or um, accidents like that. Uh, it's just a clean, simple connection. It's always charging as long as you've got it connected. Um, let me zoom the camera here just so you can see. Um, and so when I open up AUM, uh, here's the blank slate screen. Um, let me quickly uh, go over to the settings here. I'll show you it's, you know, like I said before, set to 48 kilohertz automatically. So I just make sure that those two things match on the two devices mostly just out of a habit. I don't know if it actually matters or not, so don't take my word for it. Um, that's just what I do. Uh, and so to start here, let's just say I want to get an idea going. Um, let's add a MIDI track so I can set up a sequencer to send notes from the iPad over to the laptop. Uh, I've got a bunch of different you know, sequencers that I could use, but I'm just going to use Fugue Machine today. Um, and set up a you know totally random sequence here let's uh go down a little bit in terms of octave um i will sketch out an incredibly basic pattern pencil's not working too well 
uh, don't know why. Um, and so within the settings, just a reminder, Fugue Machine has four different playheads. You can set each of those to be sent on a different MIDI out. So you can configure each playhead to play a different instrument on a different channel if you wanted to. It's uh, quite a, you know, quite a powerful tool. But for today's purpose, um, I'm just going to leave all the settings as they are. Every playhead is going out on channel one. Um, I'm just going to hit the check to show note labels so I know uh, exactly, you know, which notes I've just set up here. Um, so I've got my sequence drawn out. Uh, it's ready to be sent over to the laptop. Let me make sure that I've got an instrument ready to receive it. So I'm just going to, uh, let's see, randomly choose one. Let's go, this is already open. So let's do uh, Leco by Felt Instruments, um, a beautiful soft piano that I use all the time. Um, we'll set that up on channel two. Uh, and then, you know, now that this is ready to go, let's make sure that the MIDI is being routed to the laptop. So within the top right setting here in AUM, you've got your MIDI matrix router. Any MIDI output can be sent to any destination that you've got connected. So I'm going to send the output of all the Fugue Machine playheads over to USB 1, aka the laptop. Um, all you do is just, you know, hit the hit the box there to draw that in. You can also go up here on the top left of any app you open within AUM. The MIDI ins and outs are, are always available there uh, to choose from. So you can configure it here if you want. You could set up MIDI outputs of all playheads to be sent to the Audio 4C, specifically the USB 1 destination. So. Now that that's configured, you can go over to Ableton and, you know, it's already set to receive MIDI from all ends by default, but if you wanted to specify and be really sure that the only MIDI being received uh, by the piano that you just added here is coming from the iPad, just choose MIDI from the Audio 4C USB 2, aka iPad, uh, and then that will make sure that the only uh, sequencer playing the piano is coming from the iPad. Um, so that's ready to go. Let's hit record here. Um, now we're recording. It's ready to receive the audio. So I'm just going to hit play. Okay, that's not a terribly interesting sequence, you know, but at least we are receiving MIDI on the other end. I'm going to uh, raise the octave of these last two notes there because I don't think it's being, um, I don't think Leco is configured to receive notes that low. So let's slow the tempo down a little bit. Uh, let's divide that by 32. Let's add another playhead going slightly slower at another um, you know, octave above that. I'm also going to lower the velocity here, um, draw in a few more random notes. Just see what that sounds like. Um, There we go, a little more delicate. <laughs> Let's dial in a little bit of reverb, send it to delay as well. And let's also set up a second instrument here to complement the piano. Let's go with the Blisco Cello, also from Felt Instruments, and also very beautiful. Um, there we go. So now we've set up audio to send from the iPad over to those two instruments. We've set the MIDI uh, receipt to be the iPad only, so the iPad will sequence those two things. Um, 
Now, if you wanted to get really creative and add, you know, let's, you know, maybe add another MIDI track here. Uh, let's set it up to be um, the jazz no. Um, we can set this up to receive MIDI from uh, the chord jam device that I've set here. So I can set that to be chord jam on the MIDI from, uh, set to record. And that's, you know, a way to add some different variation to your, to your patterns here. Um, I like chord jam a lot for doing that. You can see I've got it set to the same key, C minor, on both Fugue Machine as well as Chord Jam. So it's always going to be in key, um, nothing to worry about there. But Chord Jam on the laptop is receiving MIDI. Um, let's configure that to be USB 2, just to make sure. So it's receiving MIDI from the iPad, it's generating a chord in response, and that chord uh, is what you hear on the Jasno. Uh, Pianet instrument. Okay, so now we've got MIDI going to the laptop, audio is playing on the laptop. What if we wanted to work with some of that audio on the iPad, sample it on the iPad? Well, here's how we do it. Let's add an audio channel here. Um, I'm also going to open Sampler. And add that here. Um, Sampler is an inter-app audio, so you can't just load it directly here like you can with some apps. So uh, there we go. Now Sampler is ready to go. Let's uh, clear this out. So remember from when we were talking about Oracle, the audio out uh, 3.4 that's configured here on the send return C, that is being sent to input 7.8 on the laptop. So all you have to do, record input 7.8. And just like that, you can see the audio from the laptop being sent here to the iPad. It's available to uh, sample and process um, as long as you dial in the amount on this uh, you know send return C knob so not the cleanest you know sample here but the the audio is there if you want to play with it um, another way to do this you know if you don't want to use the send return C just remember the audio going out of three four um, or the audio going out of 1-2 is always available on 7-8 and 5-6 respectively. So you could also just simply do input 5-6 if you wanted to capture everything happening on the laptop, the main outs of the laptop, that's available as well. So, let's uh, just get a little bit of a texture going here. Not a very interesting one, but you know, it's something. Let's add a filter to that. the low humming sound underneath um, that we have created by sampling the laptop audio uh, on here. And so the same thing applies, you know, if you wanted to work with that audio directly on its own channel, um, let's mute it so we don't hear it coming out, but if you wanted to see uh, where it's coming in on the iPad, you could just set up an audio channel, um, add the hardware input, so we know that everything 
configured to send return C is, is being received on 7.8. Sure enough, you can see it right there. Um, you can also see it at the top. Check to make sure that you're getting a signal. Uh, and sure enough, there it is. Uh, so just you know, to illustrate uh, what's possible there very briefly, um, you can configure audio to be sent from the laptop to the iPad, sample it here, play around with it, and then send it back to the laptop. Um, it's quite useful, uh, as you can probably imagine, and it's ended up you know, being the main way that I work now um, because of the flexibility. So let's stop the sequence here. We only have that sample playing. Just going to make it extremely ambient now. Add the even tide black hole reverb. And so, yeah, you can see you're getting the iPad audio within Ableton Live on that input 5.6. Uh, it's being sent out of here. Um, through the configuration that we've set up. Okay, so we have uh, MIDI being sent from the laptop, or I'm sorry, from the iPad over to the laptop. We've got sound being made. Um, let's you know, add some other devices into the mix uh, and show a little bit more about the possibilities here for routing. Um, if I wanted to add, for example, um, this MIDI controller into the mix too, I can do that. Um, this is a Korg Nano Key um, keyboard. Uh, it, it's, you know, very simple, uh, small. Um, it's got eight knobs uh, and a couple pads here, so it's a nice um, thing to have. Um, if I wanted to use this to, you know, play a piano part on the laptop, but also play a synth on the iPad, that's possible um, by sharing MIDI between the two devices. And so to demonstrate that, I've just gone ahead and connected it with a USB connection to the uh, USB hub that I have. Um, the Audio 4C has a USB host jack on the back of it that can accept up to eight uh, separate devices. So if you have a USB port uh, with up to eight connections, all of those connections, all those devices will be visible on the 4C, and then you can share those signals across the two devices that are connected um, to the interface. So I've gone ahead and just plugged this in uh, to my uh, USB hub, which is also connected to the Audio 4C. Um, and now that it's, you know, on and powered, I can open up Oracle, um, go back to the main menu, check out the USB host reservation, and sure enough, you can see the core nano key show up on host port three. So a nice thing about the interface is that you can reserve each of these host ports to be um, set aside for specific devices. Um, in this case, I've got uh, ports one and two set up to be reserved for the Novation Launch Key controller that I have. I use that all the time for MIDI control of Ableton, and I really like that device. Um, so I, I use it a lot, and I've set up uh, my interface so that no matter what I connect to that USB host port, it will never override um, the presence of that controller on uh, ports one and two. I can consistently know that that's always going to be the launch key, no matter what I connect. Um, so you can do that with this if you wanted to. You could reserve port 3 to be set aside for the nano key. That way, every time you connect it, it always goes to port 3. Nothing else will ever take its place. You can also rename uh, this port to be something more specific than a generic host 3 um, if you wanted to. I'm not going to do that right now, but it's nice if you are, you know, looking at a drop-down menu of all the USB host connections to know exactly what's what if you have a lot of things connected or have a complicated setup. Um, so now that we know that that's connected, um, let's go back into Ableton here. Um, 
I'm going to go ahead and add a new MIDI track for a new instrument. Let's keep the felt instruments party going here. I'm just going to use the Barzo piano on this track as a demonstration. Let me draw out the release time, slightly longer attack, just mellow it out a little bit with a darker tone so it's not as harsh. Um, yeah, and then I'll assign it to receive MIDI from host 3 of the Audio 4C, which we know now is the nano key. I'm going to set it up to be channel 1 on MIDI. You can do whatever you want there, but uh, just, you know, that's my, my habit. I always assign things to channel 1 to start. And so let me start recording so that we can hear audio. Yep. We are receiving audio there. The connection is working. Uh, that's great. So let's see. Let's say I want to configure um, one of these uh, knobs uh, to be uh, controlling the delay send on that instrument. So if I edit MIDI map, uh, select that send B, let's wiggle the knob here, and you can see it's assigned control. Yep, there we go. Um, so now I can control the amount of delay send on that particular instrument. Which is great. Um, and now let's take it one step further. So let's say I also want to play a synth that I have on my iPad, um, synth app. Let's go ahead and open one up. Uh, let's, for today, I don't know, let's use a Quanta from Audio Damage, a wonderful granular delay, or I'm sorry, a granular uh, synthesizer, uh, <laughs> not a delay, we are just playing with one. Um, let's open in this preset. Uh, let's see, let's use one from Marcus Fisher. My good friend Marcus. Let's use blue glockenspiel. Um, okay, so we're going to play this synth patch. Sorry about that, just had to adjust the uh, zoom there, so hopefully you can see it a little bit more clearly. Um, let's go ahead and open up the MIDI control. So we want to connect to a MIDI source, connect to Audio 4C, host port 3, which we know is the nano key, um, and then double check the routing here, make sure that it is in fact connected. Um, Yes, host three is connected to Quanta. You can always use the matrix here to double check um, that things are appearing as they should. So uh, we should be able to play this now with the keyboard. Yep. Great. All right, so now let's say we wanna also um, configure uh, one of these knobs to control the, um, uh, you know, what we see here on the iPad. So, let, okay, so let's set up a filter here. Um, just do a low pass filter on that instrument. We will connect to host three on the audio 4C. And then let's click on frequency learn a control for that and use this knob here so you can see it picked it up let's check that it's working yes it is so there you go now we have uh, MIDI control of two instruments on two different devices and MIDI control of two effect parameters on two different devices with just one controller. Um, that's the benefit of this setup is that all the MIDI generated by this controller is shared between the two devices and routable and assignable and very flexible to use. So let's say we now 
okay, we want to sample this Bardzo piano that we just made. Um, let's send the audio using this send return C over to the iPad. And now that should be available to sample within Sampler. Um, we can sample from input 7.8. Okay. Great. Now we know it's available. Let's just record a simple thing. So now that's working um, and you know you can easily layer ideas here if we wanted to pick back up on the sequence um, that we had configured earlier with Fugue Machine you can start that up anytime um, let's just hit play here and then it will play all the other instruments As that's playing, we can again sample uh, any of that. All of these things are being sent on send return C to the iPad. It's freely available to sample here. stop that loop real quick but you know you get the point you can easily see how you can uh, layer and and interact with uh, the two devices um, pretty seamlessly uh, and it's it's very easy to develop ideas on one thing send it over to the other thing and work with it there and, and you know vice versa it, it makes for a very flexible uh, and compact uh, setup so the same thing can apply, you know, there are so many other apps that you could use instead. Um, for instance, you know, there's there's Loopy Pro on the iPad, um, a, a very powerful uh, DAW and looping device. Um, it, all the same principles apply. Everything I just showed you in, in AUM, you can easily do in Loopy Pro. You could do it in the new Logic Pro that's been announced. Um, any kind of audio app that you want uh, or that you prefer to use on iPad, um, it, it's you know 
the same things uh, that I just showed you here in AUM could apply. Uh, any laptop audio can be received on the iPad through this setup, and then vice versa. Any iPad audio can be sent and received um, uh, over to the to the laptop for for processing. So it's quite a flexible way of working. Um, you can even, you know, if you wanted to, let's say uh, we wanted to add some drums to this mix. If I set up a drum machine here. Um, this is Playbeat 3, uh, I don't know, let's do a generic preset I've got, um, gosh, sorry, fat fingers. Um, let's do user presets, I'm just looking for one that I... Okay. Um, we could, we could very easily incorporate drums on a separate channel too. So uh, USB 1 and 2 is what's being sent now, but you could configure that to go out on 3 and 4. And if you remember back to our routing earlier, that will be received um, over here on the laptop. Let me move that into the group. Through input 7, 8. Um, so I can set that up here, set to auto. You've got the drums being sent on a separate channel, the melodies and, and uh, you know, tonal stuff being sent on a separate channel, and it's much easier to mix that way. Um, so you do have some options here um, to, to separate the mix if you'd like to. I, I, I definitely want to uh, emphasize that. And then lastly, you know, um, there's a lot of discussion about um, alternative ways to do this. Do I have to use the Audio 4C? Uh, is that the only option I have? Uh, no, it's not. You, you can do other things with the iPad and MacBook working together. If you wanted to, to just connect them um, directly with a single USB cable, you could very easily do that. Just connect your your iPad directly to the MacBook, um, and then within uh, your live preferences here, you're, you're going to use um, uh, something called IDAM, A-D-A-M, uh, audio protocol. That's just a way of sending MIDI directly over USB cable directly to uh, the laptop. Um, you can send audio and MIDI that way. Uh, to the laptop, but the, the downside of that setup is that you can't send audio back to the iPad that way. Um, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the, the one difference in using that setup. A lot of people have pointed it out that you can do that if you want a hyper-minimal setup and don't want to buy the eye connectivity interface. You can do that, but just keep in mind, um, it's not going to be the same uh, level of flexibility and control and routing um, that's inherently built into the device here, uh, the Audio 4C interface. You'd have to come up with other ways through things like loopback and um, uh, other you know software routing tools to to make that happen um, to the same extent. So, yes, you could do that if you want, um, but just keep in mind it's not exactly the same. Okay, uh, so that's it. Thanks for watching. Um, hopefully that was understandable. Hopefully it wasn't too um, long-winded or, or hard to follow, but definitely if you have any questions about anything I've showed, uh, if anything wasn't clear, if you, uh, you know, want to reach out directly, happy to talk um, through email or chat or comment, whatever, you know, the medium is. Please do, um, you know, if you find this useful, I do maintain a Substack page where I walk through my processes and inspiration um, 
in a decent amount of detail through you know written posts over there. You can subscribe for free or support. Uh, it, it means a lot. I uh, would love to see you there. And likewise here, I do plan to keep posting um, videos and, and uh, information here on YouTube as well. So uh, thanks again for, for watching and uh, until next time.